What's up everyone? Well, today I'm doing something bonsai related rather than actual bonsai. And uh, what I'm gonna do is go through some of the steps that I have used to get from basically what looks like a hunk of firewood to this point, and then how to get from here to creating a finished bonsai stand that I can use in the upcoming exhibit. All right, well, this is not my idea. And so I'm just gonna show you guys a little bit about where it comes from. So you can see in this Kokofu album that uh, there's a root stand being used for this semi-cascade tree. And this is pretty common in a lot of uh, shows in Japan where they'll have these root stands. And when I was a beginner, I could not find any information about who makes these, how they're made, what they are before they become this. You know, in other words, is it a bunch of actual fused roots that uh, someone then sort of made harder and <laughs> polished up or, or is it carved out of a block of wood or what? So it was really kind of just a, a lack of information that got me really interested in trying to recreate one of these. Here's another example. Again, a semi-cascade tree on this. So I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm, my tree is sort of a semi-cascade. I don't know, it depends on how you look at it. But in any case, um, I found after a while that really what it appears is that all of these are actually carved out of larger pieces of wood. And when you think about it, in bonsai display, one of the things that's really kind of difficult is to match the visual weight of the stand or slab with the visual weight of the tree. And so I imagine that basically someone modified, started modifying uh, natural roots in order to make stands like this to match the visual weight of the trees that they wanted to display. And then it sort of progressed from there. Let's rewind for a minute and uh, look at how I got from a chunk of wood that basically looked like firewood to here, and then we'll take a look at, uh, after that, what I'm gonna do next. So step one uh, was actually that I found the piece of wood, um, actually I don't even remember, this was a couple of years ago, and basically, um, some people were doing some urban tree trimming. It's a piece of Monterey Cypress. And so I grabbed the piece of wood. It already had a little bit of a nice shape. Uh, and in order to get it to cure, because if you take rounds like this and just let them cure from wet to completely dry without doing anything, they'll crack a lot. So I have some little cracks here, but not any big cracks. And in order to slow down the drying process, what I did was spray paint both ends with just some primer like gray primer and that kind of locks in the water uh, inside the wood a little bit so that it dries down more slowly and causes less cracking after it was dry which uh, I honestly can't say how long I left it to dry I dug it out of my little hidey hole and took a look at it and thought hmm, maybe this is the right size for the tree that I need to stand for and then step one essentially was to lay it on the ground and use a chainsaw in order to strip off a bunch of the bark and start plowing some vertical channels in here, basically accentuating the shapes that were already there. And so a lot of these, the roots that are here, just in some way based on what the wood looked like when I started. Uh, and just by sort of exaggerating that and paring it down, which is the same thing that I talked about maybe is my hypothesis for how these things came about in the first place. So once I was done with the chainsaw, I brought it back here to my shop and started using this Arbortech. And um, this is an Australian made mini grinder, uh, which is pretty powerful. And essentially it's a, a grinder with this attachment on it. And then it has a, a small uh, rotating wheel here. So I can plow channels, but the downside of this is that this part of this gets in the way. And that means that you can't make any really tight little shapes. So I really use this to sort of accentuate uh, those things that I started with, the, the channels that I started with the chainsaw, and then really get in there and try to hog out more material to start creating the shapes. In this case, there was a, a rotten piece that went all the way from top to bottom in the center. And so I was able to use the Arbortech to um, 
to hog out a lot of the material in the center uh, from the bottom here. I didn't actually touch the I didn't actually touch the top because I like the natural shape of that hole. So uh, in combination with this, I actually used a drill as well. Just I just use a regular hand drill with this half inch spade bit that's quite long, and I use that to drill long holes, particularly up here just under the top, so that I could start to clear out the wood that would be in the center uh, where my hand is right now. And that's the hardest place to get to with a lot of these tools. Essentially, like they just can't, unless you make really big spaces here, you can't get the tool between there. So with the Arbitec and the drill, I, I hogged out most of the material in order to reduce it down to um, maybe about twice what's right here. And after that, I switched to an angle grinder. Now this has a wire wheel in it, which I'm gonna to get to in a minute, but I was using this bit, which is just absolutely fantastic. Um, these, I believe, are only available in the UK. Uh, if somebody knows a domestic source, let me know. It has two carbide circles on it that are really good at hogging out material. And um, I was able to go from just a really clunky looking set of legs down to a much more elegant set of legs using pretty much just the angle grinder and this bit. I think these are sold on Harry Harrington's website, uh, bonsaiforme.com. And uh, I would highly recommend that if you have an angle grinder that you like to use for carving that you pick up some of these bits because I have never used a bit that's better than this. And in fact, I tried to switch over to using my Fordham, which is sort of like a smaller, lower powered angle grinder uh, and quickly decided to go back to this for quite some time and until I got really close. Now, once I was done with the angle grinder, I switched over to my Fordham and switched to these bits that are more for like finishing. Um, this is just a fluted high speed steel bit and I have smaller versions of this that I can use to create sort of smaller areas between uh, points here to try to create something closer to a 90 degree angle or, or an acute angle, uh, which is very difficult with a large bit like what I had in the die grinder. And then this is a carbide grit bit uh, and it acts kind of like coarse sandpaper. So I can use that to take off some of the tool marks that are uh, left by the other tools. Now, from this point forward, it actually gets quite laborious and a little bit more uh, handwork. So we'll see how that goes. But uh, I, I have to say, I don't think you need quite this many tools in order to do a project like this. In fact, if you just had a die grinder with that large bit, you could probably do almost all of it with just that single tool. Uh, it's just that I had to borrow my friend's die grinder and I guess I have the wrong tools. In any case, uh, if you're looking to do a project like this, maybe just think about getting a die grinder and a couple of really high quality bits and that should get you at least most of the way. All right, so die grinder with a wire wheel on it and I'm wearing some glasses to make sure that in case some piece of wire from this uh, detaches from the wheel that I don't end up with it in my eye. It's not gonna keep my hands free, but in any case, uh, I ha I've already used this a couple times. So I also have this, um, so this is like a dead man switch on the die grinder, uh, which is fantastic. So if I push this down, I have it attached through a throttle pedal. And so I can use this at lower speed using the pedal uh, than, or I can turn it all the way up to high speed. In any case, let's give this a try. All right, after a little bit of experimentation, I'm gonna use these 80 grit Dremel flap wheels to smooth out more of these tool marks. So let's see how this goes. All right, I used these, uh, actually four of these Dremel flap, uh, 80 grit flap wheels. Uh, and when they're, when they're new, they're bigger than this. And then as you use them, they kind of wear down and until you eventually get down to kind of a nub like this. But uh, it worked really well for smoothing out a lot of the rough edges. And now I'm just gonna follow up with some uh, hand sandpaper and maybe some filing.
All right, well, I've pretty much finished doing as much sanding as I can stand to do on all of these uh, bits and pieces down here. Some of them are really hard to get to, but the, the flap wheels were really good in terms of getting to most places, and then I just kind of hand sanded the rest. It's, uh, it's looking like it's ready for some stain. Now, one of the things that's not great about Monterey Cypress, obviously, is that the color is too light to use for a bonsai stand. So I'm gonna stain this with a black stain and then see uh, what else I need to do. I might have to take some additional steps, but there should be a pretty dramatic change once I start staining it, or maybe once I finish staining it. One of the things I've noticed while working with this wood is that it actually has really good kind of uh, cross grain cohesion. So like if you think about pine or, or fir or other uh, wood like that that's kind of soft so this is sort of a little bit harder than those woods and a little bit more um, has a little bit more tensile strength across small pieces so I was able to carve it down to smaller than what I was expecting but the design of the stand is also something that you know is sort of meant to provide stability for the different pieces so you know these cross pieces that are down here below keep these legs from being able to be tweaked and and therefore have a have a chance of breaking um, so i think you know creating the design to create some nice movement and interest in the roots is really good but you also have to think about the structural integrity of the whole thing and these guys don't have to be very big in order to provide a lot of support sort of like the bottom of a chair all of those pieces are that go across the bottom of a, a wood chair are pretty small but they're very important <clears throat> got some gloves on got an old rag piece of an old worn out t-shirt so there's less lint and then some black stain um, that i just tried remixing i've had this for a while so i probably should test it on something that i don't care about but we'll just go with it uh, this is, I think it's a gel stain, but in any case, it's very, very black, as you can see. Uh, but you can just see the, the grain through it. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply a bunch of this, particularly, uh, well, pretty much to every surface. So as you can see, that makes a pretty stark difference pretty quickly. Uh, I'm gonna continue doing this, finish off uh, the first coat and basically applying it with this chip brush that's working, working a lot better than the rag. And then I'll go back and wipe off any excess with the rag. All right, well, before I put it in the exhibit, I will definitely do some more work to the top to give it a little bit more polish, as well as add some sealant over the stain that I put onto the legs and touch up a few things uh, if I missed any spots with the stain. I uh, hope you guys learned something from that. I really would have enjoyed seeing a video like this 20 years ago uh, if one existed because I was really curious about how these things are made. So if you've made bonsai stands or if you've ever uh, tried your hand at carving and making some sort of root sculpture, I guess is what I would call this, leave it in the comments below. Thanks everyone for watching. We'll see you next time.